The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Here at Element 14 Presents, we don't want to set the world on fire. We just want to start a flame in your heart. So in order to do that, I'm going to be making one of my favorite pieces of technology from a video game, a wearable computer better known as a Pip-Boy from the Fallout franchise. Amazing hacks. Inspired designs. Each week, Element 14 Presents brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. The PIP in PIP-Boy stands for Personal Information Processor. It's a big, clunky, wearable computer that the player uses to keep track of stats, maps, biometrics, inventory, things like that. And it just oozes that retro-futuristic flair that I totally love. There are four distinct models of Pip-Boy found throughout the franchise. The Pip-Boy 2000 from Fallout 1, 2, and Tactics, the 3000A from Fallout 3 and New Vegas, the Pip-Boy 3000 Mark IV from Fallout 4, and the 2000 Mark VI from Fallout 76. So which one am I going to make? None of them, and all of them. Let me explain. There's just one minor issue with using an existing Pip-Boy model. They all rely on the player's ability to use a mouse or other external interface not represented within the game world. None of the Pip-Boys, as depicted in-universe, could work in reality if given only the controls shown. I know that for practical reasons, the game developers have to leave some things to the imagination, but if I'm going to make a gadget that actually works, I'm going to make it usable, so I'm going to make my own custom Pip-Boy that borrows the design aesthetic from multiple versions while keeping things functional. And because it's gonna come up, why don't I just use one of the existing models like the special editions? Well, one, I don't own any because they're not super cheap. Two, like I said earlier, something's gotta give and I would still have to make lots of mods in order to make it fully functional. Three, I would need much more time to integrate components into an existing shell. For reference, just look up Zap Wizard's Pip-Boy. Joshua Driggs is an industrial designer who set out to build a fully functional replica of the 3000 Mark IV model, and he spent two years and well over $1,000 and still did not finish. That's not a dig at him. His work is fantastic. But I wanted to point out just how time consuming and expensive it is to make such a feature rich piece of hardware. All right, that's enough ranting for now. Let's get to my design. Since I want to keep this at least lore plausible, I'm going to be borrowing the design aesthetic from multiple versions, specifically the original 2000 model and the 2000 Mark VI from Fallout 76, because I like how practical and realistic the design is. So I'm going to be calling my version the 2000 Mark II. There's no such canonical model, but considering what I'm borrowing from, I think it'll fit in nicely in the timeline. So here's how I'm going to break down the build of the Pip-Boy. First things first, I need a screen. Now in game, they use a miniature CRT and we didn't quite get there in our universe. Yes, there were some really advanced CRTs uh, in the late 80s, like if uh, you ever had a Sony Watchman or uh, if you're from across the pond, you might've had the Sinclair uh, TV 80, which is really cool, but one, I don't have any. Two, they're still really big and the displays are pretty small. And if I want to put it on my wrist, uh, I think the design would have to be a little bit bigger than I'm comfortable with. So for now, I'm going to stick with a 3.5 inch half VGA screen, which is uh, 320 by 480 pixels, which is plenty good. In fact, it's the same display I used on the miniature Robco terminal that I built earlier. There are no touchscreen interfaces in the Fallout universe, so while I do have a touchscreen, I'm not actually gonna use that feature. Everything needs to be tactile. 
So I've got rotary encoders, a potentiometer for the volume knob, and touchscreen, not touchscreen, tactile push buttons uh, for the main interface. Now, usually there are illuminated push buttons uh, on a variety of different Pip-Boys, but I instead went with separate tactile switches and LEDs because I found these really cool uh, LED caps of this retro Fresnel pattern that I think is nifty. And I couldn't find any illuminated push buttons, one, that are compact enough, and two, uh, that look as neat as the ones that I found. So that's what I'm gonna go with. Every Pip-Boy so far has been wearable. Yes, even in the original games. It mentions it in the user manual. So my version will be wearable too. And in order to do that, I'm going to uh, have to have some way to attach it to my wrist. So I'm actually gonna be using this scrap uh, seatbelt material that I've had for a long period of time. And that just has an aluminum bracket uh, buckle thing that I made. And I just sewed that uh, to the strapping and that will wrap around my wrist. And I'm actually going to rivet it to the underside of the Pip-Boy case just because I have a riveter and I don't use it for almost anything, so that's how I'm going to attach it. One of the more interesting things that the Pip-Boys do is keep track of environmental statistics or biometrics. And while I would love to have all of the different sensor functionalities that you find in game, that would require a lot more time to fully integrate. So I'm just gonna focus on a couple things that I particularly enjoy and can uh, demonstrate pretty easily. Um, first is localization. So I'm gonna be using a GPS module, which will of course give me my uh, latitude and longitude, and I can use that to plot on a miniature map. And I'm also gonna have an environmental sensor. So for that, I found this really cool little uh, dev board that has a temperature and humidity sensor, a light sensor, a motion sensor, a volatile organic compound sensor, and a CO2 sensor. And uh, this was just something really cool and cheap that Newark had. Um, and it communicates over I squared C, so it's pretty easy to use. I don't have access to the microfusion technology that uh, powers all the gadgets and robots in the Fallout universe for centuries, but I do have lithium polymer batteries, which are still pretty nifty. So I'll be using that to power uh, the Pip-Boy, and I'll also need to step up that voltage to a nice clean five volts for the Raspberry Pi and the other sensors. And while I do need to recharge it, I don't like the way that the USB port looks, so I made this little uh, radiation uh, logo cover so that it at least seems a bit more thematic and I can just pop that out when I want to charge it via USB. Of course, sound is one of the most important features of any Pip-Boy. You listen to the radio and holotapes and other audio logs throughout the game. And of course, the Pip-Boy has really cool sound effects as you transition through the menus. I won't have a radio for this version, but I will need some way to play back sound. So I'll need an amplifier, and for that I went with an I2S uh, breakout board. Um, this will connect directly to a Raspberry Pi, and this will connect it to an 8 ohm 3 watt speaker, so that I've got a nice little sound system capable of playing back the sound effect and musics that I want to. All right, so that about covers it for the overall details. Um, why don't I go put this together and then I'll explain how it works and we can go over the mechanical design and the code mm, a little bit. So before I go any further, I'm going to talk about the circuit as is, because this is quickly going to become way too complicated to look at and for me to cleanly point out. So as you can see, I've split the Pip-Boy up into two main compartments. On the right here, I've got the display case, which of course houses the LCD. It also uh, is the uh, mounting point for the power bracket, which has a power indicator LED and the power switch. So this will actually be directly connected to the Pi and will initiate a safe shutdown. So I can cleanly turn it off without hope, hopefully uh, corrupting the SD card. And on the left, I've got the bulk of the electronics and this is the control case. This houses all of the buttons and the LEDs 
and of course the rotary encoders. Now I didn't mention earlier, but I've also got this microcontroller here. This is a Teensy LC and this uh, keeps the wiring a bit more simple because now I just have to have power and I'll have a USB connection going from uh, this microcontroller to the Raspberry Pi so there's not tons of wires going back and forth. And of course the Raspberry Pi doesn't have an analog to digital converter so this will read the analog input uh, uh, the analog value of the potentiometer, and I'm, I'm not going to flip this around yet because that uh, reveals reveals the faceplate. Um, there's only one analog input, uh, but this also keeps things simpler because it can also constantly pull the uh, sensor module that I've got, and it will parse and format the uh, serial strings from the GPS. And the Pi is more than capable of doing that, but like I said, it just keeps everything nice and tidy. And I've also got my power boost right here, just uh, mounted mounted down below with the USB connection for charging and the power switch right here. So that will just connect, and well, it's already connected to the power boost. And we've got the analog potentiometer and the grill for the speaker. So I've just got some mounting pegs right here. So the speaker will go in there. And I just need to attach the uh, I squared S audio amplifier to the Raspberry Pi, pop the Pi in, and then just sort of shove all this in there, and we'll give it a go. And if you're wondering why the 3D printed case looks a little bit janky and there are some rough spots, well, that's because there are. It turns out that as I was going through my design process and 3D printing everything, I was modeling this around the wrong screen. I had it in my mind this entire time that I was going to use a 3.5 inch screen, but I had a 3.2 inch screen the entire time, which is a completely different resolution, so it's completely incompatible. Great, so I had to redesign the case. Okay, it's time to test this, uh, this bad pit boy out. Come over here, you gotta bear with me. This is physically awkward to do based on my position. So it should boot up. I've disabled all of the uh, splash screens and console. So it actually takes quite a while to boot up, but you can see we've got the main power LED, uh, the mode LEDs, and these will work immediately because this is all controlled via the Teensy inside, which of course has a basically instantaneous boot time. Oh, so this is still loading. Hey, there we go. So it'll display the vault Tech logo and it should auto start our program here. you under voltage me. All right, I'm just going to have to accept the low voltage warning. That's probably why it's acting sluggish. It just doesn't have enough power. So at default, we've got, oh no. Well, I am not gonna be slowed down by a battery issue. So let's put this Tenma Benchtop uh, power supply to use. Okay, round the third. All right, we've got the vault -Tec logo screen. Come on, let's, uh, let's boot into the program, please. Please, can we uh, boot into the program? Haha, <laughs> there we go, there we go. So, we've got our main mode buttons. Of course, close is just a generic cancel button. This knob down here will be our tab switch. So this switches between the various tabs of the modes. So I've just got some placeholder tabs. Obviously there's nothing in the expansion and there's no real way to load it. It's just a little flavor text. Down here we've got the date and time. So we've got the real uh, date that's American style. We've got August 12th and 2077. So whatever the year is, it will just automatically change that to display 2077. 
And let's go on over to another mode. Let's go to status. So biometrics, I thought about doing a fingerprint or a pulse oximeter, but it just did not have time to integrate it. So I figured I'd just leave that tab in there. Environment, so now we can uh, get a read on our environment. So that's the main reason for this grill is just to allow some airflow to the sensor. Now that only gets pulled once a second because the uh, I squared C breakout board only collects data roughly that quickly. It's not terribly fast, but it was pretty cheap. I don't think the uh, CO2 reading is stabilized. It usually takes about a minute to get there, but we've got our temperature in degrees Fahrenheit, and uh, I'd say it's about 82. It's pretty warm here in Northern California. And let's keep on going. The most complex mode is, of course, the data tab. We've got the minimap here and it's offset. So this is not programmed to be in the corner and this renders properly on my desktop computer, which is how I prototyped all this. But for some reason on the Raspberry Pi, it's rendering in the bottom left and this is driving me insane. And I can't just uh, offset the coordinates of that image because it's already fixed. Like everything else is in the right position. So. I'm not sure what's going on there. It probably is some weird GL error because I'm using Piglet or Piglet if you want to get the glue of uh, GL in there um, for the UI, which I'm probably definitely not going to use again. This is slow as molasses and it's really not doing a whole lot. But let me explain what's going on. So you'll notice that marker just jumped over there. That's because it got a lock on my coordinates. So right now it says the target uh, coordinates and there's a reticle on the map. Now if I go ahead and select the map, it'll be highlighted. Should be able to move the reticle around. Well, what did we learn? For one, I need a more robust power supply. Now honestly this is something I should have seen coming, but I wanted to stick with what I had on hand, but what I had on hand just wasn't good enough. But this is an iterative process. That's how this whole thing works. And if anything, this is the Mark II. So when I get to the Mark III, I can improve the features that, you know, weren't up to my standards. And trust me, there are a lot of other things I would like to change about this. But if anything, I hope you guys enjoyed the ride. And if you want to look at the 3D files or take a peek through my code, you can go to element14.com forward slash presents and find all of the files there. I'll see you guys next time.